All right, so we have a basic stub of our workflow here. But one of the things we need to think about is larger data sets. When we look at our BigQuery insert rows operation, what you can see here is that you can insert up to 500 rows into Google BigQuery table at a time. And therefore, if we were to, for example, have a thousand rows, then we would need to batch this up into two chunks of 500. And of course, you don't always know exactly how many rows might be in a given data source. Sometimes it might be a few, sometimes it might be a lot. So it's best to architect your workflow to handle that uh, so you don't have any future issues. So the best way that I can think to do this is using a list helper. We have an operation called chunk, and the function of this is to do exactly this. It's to split a list of items into lists of a fixed size. So what we can actually do is we can take our data and split it into chunks of 500. Wow, that happened. 500. And just to give you uh, a quick understanding of what that looks like and make it easier to see in the logs, I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate this with a list size of five. And I'm gonna label this create batches. terminate here because I just want to show you the output of this operation. Okay, so we can see we passed it a fairly large list here and we said hey give it to us in batches of five which means we have a list of lists here. You can see this lens list ends after one, two, three, four, five items. So that's how this works. The second thing we'll want to we'll need to do now is add an additional loop because you're going to be looping each batch and then this section of the workflow is going to be looping each item in a given batch. Let me get rid of this for now, and we'll add a loop. And we'll label this for each batch. And simply pull in our other loop to it. And then we'll link our, loop, our batch loop to the batches themselves. And in turn, we'll need to loop our sort of each item in the batch loop to the output of, of this. So the next step we'll need to do is because we're within a batch, we're adding each item to this list, we'll need to pull this data up here to get our list. And then the other thing we need to do is we need to pull our BigQuery step here. And so each batch will be processed, we'll, we'll have its data prepared first, and then inserted into BigQuery. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to just do a couple small batches, smaller batches. So I'll do 100 rows. And I'll do 50 batch sides. So I'll do two batches. That should do it. I'll give it a run. Okay, so we have a successful run here. A couple tips here on how you can kind of parse your logs. So what I want to do is I just wanted to show you the loop this loop happening and 
So I just clicked successful in the drop down menu, started to type the step sort of uh, not name, but I guess label. And then now it's showing me each execution of this loop. So in this case, um, the output is a batch, right? And this is a batch of 50. And then the second loop is the second batch. There's two. And then the third loop is basically the end of the loop, which basically says, OK, you're done. You can continue on to the next part of the workflow. If we, we can hit these little arrows and expand up or down just to kind of see what happened before and after each step. And in this case, for the second iteration of the loop, the very last step before it starts is this big query insertion. So we can see that we inserted our rows successfully into BigQuery. And then same thing here. We can pop it up and see that this worked here as well. Now, you could build this uh, just like this and be perfectly fine uh, if, you, if you have just a single ETL job. But let's say that you're thinking about um, multiple possible ETL jobs in the BigQuery and uh, you want a quick and easy way to stand those up without necessarily having to copy this or go through this process every time. What I want to introduce to you is the concept of a callable workflow. And the idea with a callable is that you can turn your workflows that you spent all this time and energy into building into uh, reusable components uh, so that you don't necessarily need to go through all the steps of building the workflow all over again, but actually uh, turning it into a bit of a utility. So the question is, how do you do that? So what I want to show to you is how to go through that process. Uh, it's essentially what we'll do is we'll create some copies of this workflow and we'll start transforming them into what would be known as a callable. So in a new tab, I'm just going to open up the dashboard. I copied the name of my workflow in case I need to search for it. I know it's in my personal workspace. It's right at the top, so I don't need to worry about that. And the first thing I want to do, it's going to be a two-part workflow. And I'll explain why as we go. I'm going to call this workflow the orchestration workflow. And again, we'll, we'll explain this here in a minute. Oh, I, uh, I built this out ahead of time, so I'll need to make a, a new copy. So we'll call it two. Okay, let's go ahead and duplicate that. call this the batch insert, which I'm sure I've already done that too, so I'll just put that here. Okay. Alright, so essentially we have three copies of the same workflow right now. The first step that I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the trigger of this workflow to a callable trigger. There's two types of callable workflows, trigger and respond, and just trigger. Uh, trigger and respond lets a workflow from another, triggers a workflow from another workflow and returns the result back. So it says, hey, um, here's your data, hey, I'm finished, whatever it may be, you can, you can architect it. It's almost like turning it into an uh, API that can be used within Tray itself. Uh, I'm going to start with that because what this allows us to do is define an input schema. And uh, an input schema simply means that just like any one of these connectors, you have input data. For a callable workflow, you can provide variables that can be passed to it, such as your, your source data or number of batches that you want or project ID and the table data set ID and the table ID, all those sorts of things. Like you can 
you can pass them as variables to your services. And so that's what I want to do. I'm going to create an item in our input schema called data, which is an array. I don't really care um, what the items look like specifically as far as an input scheme is concerned, but I do want to note that each item is an object. The other thing I want to do is I want to create a variable called batch size. And we know that's an integer. I need to create a mappings variable because the mappings uh, may be different from one workflow to the other. So I'm going to call that key mappings rather doing just being specific because that's a it's not a value mapping, right? It's a key mapping. This is an array. And if we look back at how this was done here, we can see it's an array of objects with two strings from and to. Okay, so this is, we'll call this a mapping. It's an object. And it has two properties from. Oops. From and to both short text or strings. Okay. And then the last things I want to add are my project ID, my data set ID, and my table ID. Right, so I can just punch those in. ID is it? I believe it's table ID. And what was it again? Data set ID. same order. Okay, so these are all the inputs. We could mark them as required or, or not. I mean, technically, I think all these are required, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and save it for now. And so what this allows me to do is I can put a callable here and essentially replace all this process below with one connector. So this is with a fire and wait for a response. And now I've picked that. And so now I have all of these variables to use, right? So I can take here and I can say, here's my array of data. I can say, here's my batch size. I can add to my key value mappings here. So I can say, oops, if you look back here, is ham, was ham lowercase id, capital ID. Add one more, lowercase id, capital ID. And then finally, I need my variables for a big query. So if I want to come over here, and again, I want to find that successful big query execution. I can actually, the thing to be aware of is um, these are, when you see things like this, where you have an authentication and then they, they give you a, a drop down of specific items in your um, instance, that's what we would call a dynamic drop down list. And that is actually, there's another API call happening in the background to get that, that data. So in this, the, the thing to be aware of is that um, what's actually passed to the APIs on the back end of what's what you see is the literal values in your uh, logs, right? So if we think about the beginning of this tutorial where we conducted a successful insert in the BigQuery, you will, in this case, you will need to uh, know what the sort of API name of those inputs are. So I'm just going to copy each one of these 
from the input lines and paste them in as my variables. So I have a table ID, uh, the data set ID is my test data. Data set. Ooh, I got the table wrong. And the project ID is this guy right here. There we go. Okay. Now, at the top level, I need none of this any longer. Just get rid of it. Now you can see, anytime you pull data, you just call your ETL process, and it's reusable. Okay, which means I need to change some things here. So first thing I'm going to do is I don't need to get my data, so I can just get rid of that. I need to pull my list for the data being passed, and then I need to pull my batch size to the batch size being passed. Then. I could call it a day. I could call it a day and um, this process would work okay. I would need to have what's known as a callable response here, yeah. which is basically because this trigger is know, a trigger and respond, I need a response back. And um, you can actually edit the response schema as well. So if you wanted to pass some data back for whatever reason, you could. Um, if there was some sort of ID that came out of BigQuery whenever the execution ran, you could you could save those IDs to a list and pass them back. Let's see. Yeah, this is just a response. You could pass um, each of those responses back, whatever you want. In this case, I'm just going to leave it as is. However, depending on sort of what you want to happen here, you again you could leave it as is but you you may want to speed up your execution time and in that case what i want to do is imagine if actually this process here was a sub process uh where where we were processing where sort of the insertion of a batch was a sub process and we could parallel process each of those meaning while we basically send our batches over to BigQuery, um, almost um, just just you know not, maybe not even a second apart, and they're all sort of getting processed at the same time for rapid insertion, and and that could be more important for larger data sets. So I want to talk a little bit about that. It's the same sort of process, except this time, rather than using a call and wait for response, we're going to use just a call or a trigger fire and forget this I guess is what we're technically calling that and why we do that is because we, number one we want to get rid of all this right because that's going to be relegated to this sub process and basically we're going to say process the batch which basically means to insert it into right shift if this were a call and wait for a response this process would have to complete before the next loop happened. If it's just a trigger, we basically say, hey, go do your job, and um, let's move on to the next one and tee them up for their job, which means that they're all happening, not quite in parallel, but pretty much in parallel. So to do that, we're gonna replace this trigger with a callable. Call that trigger, so we don't need to reply back. We don't need this data. We don't need these batches. We just pull our loop up. Pull our big query or our get our data storage up and our big query up. And we get rid of that. Now, with a trigger, you cannot specify an input schema at this stage. There's some ways to hack around that, but I'm gonna do this the official way. And what I'll do is I need to get some test data into this workflow in order to configure it properly. So I'm going to put a terminate here. Not going over the logs. 
I'm going to put a terminate here because I just want to get one batch in. And the information that's necessary for this workflow is essentially the batch itself and the key mappings. Those are the, and uh, sorry, also the uh, big query uh, input settings. And we need all that. What we don't need is the batch size. So what I'm going to do, call this ETL, I'm going to batch insert, and we can define our input scheme here. So I can say batch, which will be an array coming out of this. Key mappings. data set ID project ID and table ID yeah. so I can pull these up oh, I did that wrong data set ID ID, table ID, great. Now this will fail when I run my test because I can't reply back. And if, you, if, you're, if a trigger and respond doesn't reply back, the upstream workflow fails, which in this case I'm okay with. Let's run it. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have a failure you'll see an error like this when a child fails. So it's like the child failed. Uh, so therefore, basically, it couldn't reply back. If you actually look at the logs, right, it didn't fail. I stopped it before it could respond. and just sort of passed it down the line. And now here I sit at my um, insertion workflow with all my inputs, right? So I can say use input. What this will do is it defines the output based on um, the execution that I said use output on. All right, before that, Trey didn't know what the output schema of this trigger was because we, we, we couldn't define it like we could on the, the other type of call. Open. But now it does. So in that case, what I can do is I can link it all back up again. So that's my batch that I'm looping here using my mappings that I'm passed through basically from the upstream workflow. And this is my big query step where I'm gonna link up things like project ID, data set ID, and table ID. I'm ready to go. So I can remove my terminate and Again, because this is a trigger and not a trigger and respond, I don't need a response back. The upstream workflow doesn't care, technically speaking, whether or not um, this execution was successful. So what I can then do is I can come all the way back up to the parent where I have the failure and I can restart the process. Now in this case, again, just for testing purposes, I'm gonna leave this terminate here. So this workflow will fail, but I'm gonna send it down to this workflow because I wanna see that this work, that this execution works. So let's, let's run that. Okay, so we've, we've rerun it by just hitting this, which passes it through uh, to this workflow, which again will fail because we're terminated and not replying, which passes it through to our batch insertion workflow, where we have a successful execution. Good, that's exactly what we want. And um, essentially now we, we've turned this into a utility. So, so as far as um, you know, making this a production ready workflow, literally that's all we had to do. Now. One other step you could consider um, based on the sort of service that you're using, the amount of data you're processing, all this sort of stuff, is you could consider adding a minor delay here. 
if you wanted to essentially slow down the number of calls that could possibly be hitting BigQuery all at once. Um, I, I've actually tested this with uh, quite a few rows. I think I did 10,000 rows of data, 500 batch size, and they all hit BigQuery not too far apart, and there was no problem. Um, so this is just, you know, it just you might find that um, if you get rate limited or something like that, I it, I just don't know. There's some a lot of these services are quite different in terms of their SLAs based on what you're paying, yada yada yada. So, in any case, you can add a delay if, if that becomes problematic, but I, I really don't think it's necessary. Um, I think they're spread out just enough that you're not going to get rate limited. All right, well that's it. I'll provide the templates here uh, at the end of the uh, blog post, and I hope you enjoyed.